Welcome to Support Life, a program focusing on current social issues from a life-affirming perspective. I'm Gavin Bolch, and our guest is Anne Lastman, a post-abortion grief counsellor. Anne, welcome. Thank you, Gavin. Being in front of the camera is not uh, a strange thing to you? Not really, not. <laughs> I've been here a few times. Yes, yes. and uh, travelled overseas a little? 17 countries around the world, including I did a... a interview on Vatican Radio. Wow. Yes, for an hour too. That. Didn't run out of words either. <laughs> so um, winding the clock back, Italy has an interest to you as a child. Yes, I was born there. I lived there till I was 10 years old. Um, I have some really beautiful memories, which I actually go to in times of distress or trauma. I'm able to go back to Grandad and Nana. And the town was called? I was um, Siderno, Siderno Marina. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where mum's side of the family comes from and dad's side comes from Reggio in Calabria. Yes. Wow. Yes. So olive trees, what, what was the main income on the farm? In, in Grandad? Mm. Oh, it was all I can remember, remember I was only 10, there was, I remember wheat, I remember orchards, olives, um, fruits, vines. Mm -hmm. So all of that. Granddad had huge, huge, huge land. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. There, were, there was Granddad and Nana in their house, Auntie and her family in her house, and Mum and Dad had their house. So, and then on Dad's side of the family, Mum and Dad had their house there too. Hmm. Yes. So then, uh, after the 10 years, you uh, move as a migrant family to Australia. Yes, we did. We, Dad came first to set up, um, get a job and um, set up a house so that Mum and myself and my brother came over, I think a couple of years after him. Hmm. So I would imagine that you were toughened up a little bit by your reception by Australians. Um, bearing in mind this is the early uh, middle 50s uh, Italian were the persona non grata in those days mm. um, I we used to get beaten up as kids so but that's okay I learned how to do it too mm -hmm. so um, did you play argles as we used to call it no, but I played marbles. Okay. We used to call them marbles, uh, and we had uh, little little round glass balls, and we had some yeah, big ones it. called... Um, tombolas. Tombolas. So, yes. so tell me about the tombolas. What happened with them? Oh, I loved the tombolas because I used to put them... I discovered that if you put them in your hands, that's in the days before nail polish and things like that, mm -hmm. you put them in your hands and then you hit someone with it, it hurts. Mm, okay, so, so we are saying to those watching the program, uh, <laughs> don't let your children watch this and don't give them any argles to play with. Marbles. Use the right word here. It's marbles. Now, talking about words, um, mm. they're very important, their yes, use. They are. And uh, so take me through how we misuse words today. In my area of work, as you know, I've been in it 17, 18 years this year. What we've done as a society to make abortion normal, we've changed the language. We've gone from we're having a baby to it's a bunch of cells, it's tissue, it's gel, it's nothing. Well, it's very difficult to put a an image on a bunch of tissue, isn't it? The only tissue I know about is the ones I wipe my nose with. That's all. And as for cells, I don't know what a cell looks like. Mm. So unless we use the word baby, the moment we start using the word baby, then in my mind, we all can see what a baby looks like, a newborn, a little one, an older one. So. Uh, for example, even in same-sex marriage, we're using marriage um, not as it was intended to be 
in the first place between a husband, a male and a female, united together for life. But we're normalising something that hasn't been normal. And what about the word choice? I hate it. I'm sorry. I, because choice can be a good word. You know, if we all of us make a choice. I make a choice whether I buy a black blazer or a red one. Mm. I know red is loud, and so I won't. So I've made a choice. Okay. But in the context of abortion, choice is not a good word. Because what we're saying is you've got a choice whether you have this baby or not. And no, we don't. Once the child is conceived, it's an entity of its own. It's a human being, all of its own. What the mother has a choice with is being a host, a beautiful host or hostess to that child that she's carrying. But sadly, nowadays, she's choosing not to be a host to this baby that mm. she's carrying mm. and takes it off to make sure that it dies. Now, of course, men play a role in this. Mm -hmm. uh, we can be very quiet. We can be very helpful regarding the abortion by driving our spouse or partner to uh, a clinic and still saying nothing. What, what's happening here? Helpful? Where did you get that word from? Here's one of the bad words. Mm -hmm. How can you be helpful mm -hmm. taking your wife or girlfriend to a place to terminate the life of your child? And then you have to remember that while you're snoring at night, Lots goes through her mind. Hmm. Was my baby? Should I have done it? Why did you take me? Why didn't you hold on to me and our baby when hmm. I was so weak? Hmm. Why did you back down? Why didn't you support me when you knew I was so weak and I couldn't do it? And thank mm -hmm. you for that. We'll come back after the break and look at what men go through at this time. Okay, thank you. You're watching you. Support Life and we'll be back soon. Welcome back to Support Life, I'm Gavin Bolch and our guest is Anne Lastman, a post-abortion grief counsellor. And there was um, a moment in your life where a crunched up piece of paper changed a worldview. What was that moment? After moving to Melbourne, um, about three or four weeks later, I went to church one Sunday and there was a um, piece of paper in the foyer, scrunched up on the ground and it looked out of place. So I picked it up to have a look what it was and throw it in the bin. But it was an ad for a conference, a, a Catholic conference at Sacred Heart College in Oakley. And I thought, oh, I might as well go because it's on a Sunday and I don't know too many people, so I could meet some people. And I decided to go. That was the moment that changed my life because I had great visions for my life. I was going to be this very famous professor of Old Testament theology because mm -hmm, I loved that. And all my studies were leading. I've got master's degrees in all of that area and bachelor's and all of that. And it was leading into that. That's, that was my plan. That changed everything because when I went to that conference, there was a table there called Abortion Alternatives. And um, I, during the breaks, I went around to look at all the tables and books. And I came to this table and there were, I remember meeting Tanya O'Brien there from the Helpers of God's Precious Infants. She's a gorgeous lady. Um, and there were lots of pictures of aborted babies and that surfaced for me my own abortions 
and even though I was having nightmares in the past about dismembered babies, this was actually the image of the dismembered babies that I was dreaming about over many, many years. But I didn't connect dots. I just thought them as nightmares. I didn't connect abortion and nightmares. So I remember grabbing two or three of those photos and running out. And I was found a corner by myself and cried and because I had been told that um, my 10, 12 week and 14, 15 week was only the size of a peanut in a shell. And these were fully formed babies. Mm. This was the tissue, the cells and everything that they, they still talk about today. Well, they're not. They're fully formed babies from six to eight weeks. And it's a lie that's being told. I was interviewing a man uh, in, in a studio. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about recording and uh, the person was a, a known recording artist and uh, they asked what I was doing and I said I was conducting uh, some interviews. And uh, on the topic of um, abortion and post-abortion trauma, and he dropped his head, mm. wept, and I said, what's wrong? And he said, I'm the cause of um, abortions yeah. because I was silent and drove that person, that woman, to an abortion clinic. Yeah. And it haunts me every hour, the man says. So well, what's going on here? The human person isn't designed to take their child to be killed. It's not written in our being, either the male or the female. The male generates his son or daughter and fathers and is supposed to father them. When he fathers his son well, he teaches him how to be a man. When he fathers a daughter well and, and honours her, he teaches her what to look for in a future male that will honour her the way he has done. So a human being, a man, is not um, designed to take his son or daughter to die. As a woman who carries in her body this baby, gives it hospitality and, and food, is not designed so why should we be surprised when we grieve that over taking our child to die mm. we shouldn't be in fact this is why I called my book redeeming grief which oh, by the way it's still available from freedom publishing I've sold out but freedom publishing has them I called it redeeming grief because it's a good grief Abortion grief is a good grief because it ensures that this child has not passed by unknown. If there's no grief, if we suppress it so much, not only will it make the woman very sick and the male very sick, but the memory of that breath of God is also lost. So we shouldn't be surprised. Can I bring in Miss Carriage here too for a moment? Yes. We are permitted to grieve, aren't we, for a miscarriage? It's an open thing. Uh, your family, your friends grieve with you when you've lost a baby. And people speak openly. She's lost a child. She miscarried at 12 weeks. There's no difference. It's only in the manner of the dying. Mm. One is given permission to grieve openly and, and acknowledged. Her loss is acknowledged. But the other one isn't. And it's my job to reconcile the mother and the baby, to help to change both in the mother and the father where they come. Not the dying, because we can't change that. But in seeing or the perception of the dying, not the manner of the dying, but to grieve for the dying mm -hmm. of the child. And what, what we'll do after the break, we'll come back and we'll open another 
Pandora's box. Okay. You're watching Support Life. We'll be back after this break. Welcome back to Support Life. I'm Gavin Bolch, and our guest is Anne Lastman, a post-abortion grief counsellor. We were talking about what men and women go through. Well, we were starting to touch on that, and I said that there was a Pandora's box. I'm ordained uh, in a Christian denomination, and I believe the Pandora's box that we are too afraid to open is to do the right thing by men and women in our congregation who we're responsible for as shepherds to talk about and to say it's okay to open it up and talk about the post-abortion trauma issue this this grieving that's necessary to take Mm -hmm. place would you like to comment on that i have actually written a chapter in the book i'm not trying to promote the book but i have written a chapter in it because it is so important as pastors you have a captive audience and you will be called to by the Lord to say why didn't you speak about it because you need to lead your people not only to to bring forward those who are hurting but the whole congregation to grieve for every child that died today, every child that died this week, someone has to grieve for the children. Every child that died was an amen of God, a yes of God. And we need to grieve for that loss because the parents can't do it at the moment. At some stage in the future, we hope that they do. And that the Lord leads them to someone who can help them. But for the moment, all of us have to grieve for every child Mm. that has died this past week gone by. And worldwide, there would have been over a million. Mm. So when we come across um, a little verse like, from James, true religion is to care for widows and the fatherless. How does that play into this thinking of the responsibility of the sheep and the lambies in the body of Christ. We need to love them. We need to gather them up. Not only the mothers and the fathers, but the infants who've died, to let them know that they are loved. We need to be able to remember every one of them. If we believe, now, if we believe we all come as a result of a breath of God. If we believe that, then we have to honour that breath. And pastors, priests, rabbis, um, whoever's in charge of a parish or, or a group, pastoral group, help to remember that not only there's a person, a woman or a man hurting, but a child that has passed by unnoticed. Mm. It would be a desire, something I would love to be able to form or gather together a group who would gather around a globe, the globe, and put 50 million crosses. Do you know that? Mm just to show humanity what 50 million babies have died look like, what 50 million looks like. Because I can toss out a figure like 50 million. Mm. What does that mean? Nothing. It's Mm. a five and a lots of noughts. But they don't translate into humans. But visually, because we are visual people, I would love to show, or even just in Australia, 100,000. What does 100,000 look like? Mm. It's, it's, we can't, we can't do it because we can't see 100,000. But 100,000 crosses or 100,000 roses Mm. of pink and blue. Mm. 
that might wa- that might wake up our society from its slumber that says or that has helped to put to sleep a society that can't think well that has humanity not caring mm. a, a selfish society in a way yeah, a, a selfish slothful creature yeah slow to move uh, scared to stand up yes on behalf of those who are voiceless that's right mm. we need to be able to put a voice to af- every child that has died in the past year mm-hmm. so uh, as leaders mm-hmm. of small groups um, we're not uh, offering any favors here by keeping quiet and not opening that Pandora's box no you're not mm-hmm. no you're not because the suffering still goes on mm-hmm. the woman sitting there with the guilt that she feels is still sitting there she still grieves she still remembers. Do you know, I had an experience last Christmas of being in the Knox Shopping Centre and there was Santa travelling on his Santa train with lots of children um, on it. And a mother called out to her little girl, Miriam! And I couldn't stand it anymore. I had to run, the tears came because my little girl's called Miriam. In this moment of remembrance and grief, Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you to sign off and say goodbye, not myself concluding the program, but yourself. And would you like to do that? Okay, thank you, Kevin. I want to say to those listening, someone who's awake during the night and can't sleep because of a memory and a pain, you don't have to do it alone. I'm there. I'm Anne Lastman. You can Google me and find me. God has loved you and he's loved me, I know, because I've seen my children and they are so beautiful. And I have actually heard them with my ears, not in my head, but in my ears, saying to me, Mummy, we love you. We love you. So to anyone who's hurting, Please, don't do it alone. You don't have to do it alone. And God loves you. Your sin isn't bigger than his sacrifice. His sacrifice is much bigger than your sin. And he's waiting to hold you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.